This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien kicks off today's show with this week's grain market outlook. Dan talks through scenarios he has for a few Kansas crops as we look forward. The Beef Cattle Institute's Brad White, Bob Larson, Brian Lubers, and Phil Lancaster keep the show rolling with segments from their Cattle Chat podcast, where they discuss leaky gut and sudden calf death. Chip Redmond, K-State meteorologist, concludes the show by explaining the weather pattern change and his concern for animal comfort in the coming weeks. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Friday show with a grain market outlook with K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Shelby. Dan, starting off our conversation with what are futures looking like? Well, of course, they're not as high as uh, grain sellers in Kansas and other and elsewhere would like them to be. Uh, we did see uh, corn close yesterday, September corn at 406, so it is above four, and uh, new crop uh, December at 420 and three quarters. August soybeans 1116 had been lower. A uh, new crop bids 1079 and a half. September wheat again po- immediate post harvest from in most cases here for hard red winter wheat uh, 561 and a half. Uh, also, so basically you had a had a little bit uh, up about two two to three cents for corn, up about five five cents for the August contract, but up 15 on November and then uh, September. Uh, wheat at, at down about six, and I, I think a, a big issue to look at is is what the um, what the direction of of the I guess the carry in the market is. You, when you look at the corn futures complex, so you've got uh, a, a carrying charge of from the September to the December contract of just under five cents a bushel from the December to March to uh, you, you'd be looking at about four point eight cents again, just under five over five cents in may so that, that's a that's a futures complex that's giving farmers a signal to store grain and uh it, it's uh, basically telling them from as you as you're sitting at by the time you get new crop bids 420 and, and three quarters you've got july out at 452 so that's a 30 cent carry most farmers in in that when as they see the volatility of markets they'll they'll say gosh you know in a moving market, we can gain that in a day, but I guess as more of a conservative approach to storage, we put on we could put on storage hedges, and as particularly for a, a far, on farm stored grain that has little less cost and and make some money on that. So that's that's something to consider. We have carrying charges also in soybeans once we get past November, and, and if, if anything, they're a little bit stronger up front than the uh, than for corn. So. November harvest beans, their carry from September 24 contract to November is about, they're about two, two and a half cents a, a bushel. But beyond that, you're uh, from November to January, over seven cents a bushel. Uh, from uh, January to March, uh, about just under five and, and about four uh, from out, out into May. So, so again, another uh, another market that's giving carrying charges, given what the market knows right now, given its assumptions about what we're going to have for the rest of the summer, how this crop is going to going to work out, it's giving signals in corn and soybeans to plan to store next year's crop. But there's a lot of uncertainty that has to be dealt with as as you work through that. I should also say for wheat, we also have some carries for the for uh, for wheat hard red winter uh, from September to December. About uh, just under six cents a bushel, uh, j- uh, about four and four and two thirds cents a bushel from December to March twenty five. About three point six cents a bushel out to May. Then, of course, it drops off into into July. So, at, at this point in time, uh, for wheat as well as as these other as these other uh, uh, markets go, uh, we have the presumption of good crops coming. Not markets really not accounting for a lot of risk. It's 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 thinking. Well, gosh, whatever we harvest, we'll have to store it. So it's giving these carrying charges. Uh, so you know, when when you look at the likelihood of that occurring, that that will be a, a largely from here on out a weather dependent event. 
And I know my our, our colleagues, uh, such as Chip Redmond in house here at Kansas State, other independent analysts have been talking about uh, forecasts for some some pretty pretty hot conditions in 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 August. Here's my take on that. You know, we've been watching the these uh, uh, El Nino La Nina transition forecasts for for several months now, and and uh, what happened in uh, as I understand, it's going to view from our our climatological weather weather forecasting brethren that the time of hotness and dryness which you thought was going to come originally in 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 july well it's it's now being pushed off into august september uh, well basically into late summer and fall yet you've got uh, forecasts of some pretty hot and dry weather coming in uh, when, when i look at the current crop conditions which i think the market's pretty much paying attention to because they'll take those crop conditions put them into yield models and they're they're shooting shooting to the high side 181 bushel corn 52 bushel soybeans or more and and uh really uh the market looks at that based on quantified numbers especially with algorithmic traders computerized traders and uh gosh you know uh, uh, we take the attitude of show me any crop problems well if if we do get these uh, forecasts of, of uh, pretty hot and hot and dry conditions, and not just with El Nino, but other factors all coming into play. Then we look and see uh, what the patterns historically have been for these good to excellent percent ratings for these crops, and do they tend to hold up? And and uh, in in most most years, we we tend to see as uh, as we go go on from July into August, September, a decline in those numbers. So I I, I think Shelby, that'll be the Real issue that we'll be wrestling with here from from here on out to uh, uh, out in, into September. Uh, now I know we've got uh, farmers that that have old crop grain and storage, and what do we tell them? <laughs> you know how do you, how do you tell them to deal with that? Because if if they've held grain this long, haven't moved it, then uh, they'll have to cut the fine edge of waiting for some crop risk to give them some some better prices but then not waiting too long and having the market to continue on on their in their current narrative of large crops and then collapse even further into into fall so it's it just seems to me like a a very risky time very uncertain time uh if if uh, if we felt better about uh buying call options it'd be we we tell people gosh you know go ahead and sell sell your cash and get the best basis situation you can. By the way, there are some pretty good in, uh, uh, isolated basis bids for corn. Actually, in western Kansas, some, we, we have some pretty good – we have positive basis bids. So that's showing the other side of all that. Point is, so going forward, one, th- one thing they could do is to sell, sell cash, get a good basis off of it. And then if, they're, if they think there's a potential for a strong rally, to buy a call option. And uh, they, they wrestle with the issue of how much they spend for it. I would I would like to add in that we've tried to, at least on my part we've tried to put together probability based scenarios where these markets might go for the for uh, uh, heading off into the in, into the rest of the uh, this uh, well the summer and growing season off into fall. And if you'd like, I can go ahead and talk about those. Yep, go ahead and tell us about those scenarios, Dan. Okay, uh, so I. It's a yield-driven issue. It's a it, we'll have a yield-driven uh, corn market from now into harvest, basically, and uh, it's probably about a fifty percent chance, uh, given where we stand right now, that the USDA is right. One hundred eighty-one bushels an acre, no problem. But some some would probably say, well, gosh, that's only a, you mean that's only a fifty percent chance. I, I I think with the with the hot dry weather is forecast out there, probably you know we're looking at. Either record 177.3 bushel an acre, or or somewhere between the, the 181 and the 177, say 179. So I think my own thinking, you've got like a three out of ten chance that that USDA is going to end up with that number being too high. And so they so plug in 100, 179 bushels an acre, run the math on ending stocks, stocks to use. And you go from the USDA's price projection of four dollars and thirty cents to about four dollars and fifty-five. If through a combination of things being too wet, it's some places too hot and dry. Others, if you end up lower than that, if you only get the old record yield, one hundred seventy-seven point three, you're down to about a fourteen point eight billion bushel corn crop, one point eight billion bushel uh, ending stock stocks to use about twelve percent instead of fourteen, and prices actually prices. Closer to four seventy-five to five dollars. 
So I think they, they uh, call people that, that are over-optimistic sunshine pumpers. <laughs> so I don't want to be just a sunshine pumper, but the, but the point is that with, with heat coming on, I give it you know, it's a coin flip as, as to whether this continues with, with such great conditions on, all the way out to the end of harvest. And I'm saying there's a, at least a 50% chance of something less than what we have now for, for production and prices from 450 to $5 and going higher. So I, I guess uh, it's one of those situations you, you make a statement like that, and then uh, if, you, if you're right, you'll tell everybody what you said. If not, you hope that they don't come back and, and listen to it and, and review it. I would say also for wheat, I, I'd, I'd go with about the same percentages, about a 50% chance that the USDA is 52 bushel an acre, record high, that we actually get that. However, coming into August, Hot, dry conditions right during reproductive stages for soybeans. So my own thinking, 30% chance that we come off of off, off the record yields that the USDA has, closer to 51, 50, something like that, even possibility being lower if we really turn desperate. And so instead of the 11, 10 that the USDA is projecting in, in their August set of numbers, I'd, I'd be looking closer to 12 and a half to 13, something like that. So people will look at that and they'll say, gosh, that's optimistic given what we've just viewed. But we, but we haven't viewed any of the heat that we have coming yet. And that, so I, I think it's a coin flip, a 50% chance that we're, what we have right now will, will carry us through in, into harvest. But uh, there's still a lot of probability of, of, uh, of us not ending up at these lofty production levels and, and prices responding somewhat higher and, and uh, giving some people some better selling prices. Dan, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us our grain market update. Thank you very much, Shelby. I appreciate the opportunity. That was K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but stick around because we have more for you ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Friday show with a segment from the Beef Cattle Institute's Cattle Chat Podcast. Today, we're joined by K-State's Brad White, Philip Lancaster, Bob Larson, and Brian Lubers. We've heard a lot about leaky gut and managing leaky gut. I I gotta start out with, what is leaky gut? So it's the kind of common term for... I don't know if you want to call it a syndrome. I don't know what exactly I would call it. But what happens is that we have in the gut, we have a physical barrier between the inside of the digestive tract and then the rest of the animal. So you've got the food and digestive, and you've got bacteria and stuff like that in that digestive tract. And that physical barrier keeps that bacteria and other possible toxins and other things from being absorbed across the digestive tract into the bloodstream of the animal. Well, what happens is, this is still very new research, but certain situations, and we don't know all of them, tend to cause that physical barrier to be disrupted. And that allows large molecules, and we think maybe bacteria, to be able to get across that uh, intestinal barrier when they normally wouldn't be able to. And that's why we call it leaky gut, because things that normally don't cross the intestinal barrier leak across into the bloodstream. And so that's where the, the term comes from. Bob, this is a relatively new occurrence. We haven't, haven't talked about this for a long time. What's your perspective? Well, I would agree. It's, it's interesting in that I, I was certainly not taught leaky gut in either my veterinary classes or nutrition classes. And it is interesting to think about because I could see you know, some health issues. Uh, I can see some performance issues as well. So one of my questions, Philip, is are there some dietary components? Do we see this more on a, a grain type diet or can it also occur on a forage type diet or is it during transitions or what's the theory of why we see some leaky gut type syndromes? We don't know. I mean, we're really in the early stages of this. We've got research out there that shows that different diet components in young calves. So a lot of the work has been done in young calves, um, so like dairy type calves where we really control the nutrition different starch contents of the starter diet, different um, formulations of the milk replacer have tended to increase the permeability of the GI tract in these calves. We know in some older animals that acidosis will cause some uh, increase in permeability. 
And then we know that animals being off feed for several days. Um, so decreased feed intake for, you know, three to five days, um, severely decreased intake, not just a little bit, but severely decreased intake for three to five days will increase the permeability of that gut. So um, we're still figuring out what factors cause it, when does it happen, how extensive is the effect, is it the whole GI tract, is it just different segments of the GI tract, and so we're still really figuring out a lot about this condition and um, how we can try to manage it. Is it associated with anything I can see, such as um, manure consistency or anything like that, or is is that not as simple as that? It could be. In the case of acidosis, we would be able to see some more runny diarrhea-type manure and things like that. But some of these other conditions, no. We haven't got any real evidence that says there's any clinical signs that I can see in the animal. Yeah, I, I know we're still kind of in the early phases of trying to figure this syndrome out, but... What are the ideas as far as trying to prevent it or control it? Is it pretty much all dietary interventions or just what exactly do I do to try to minimize the chance? Well, right now, yeah, most of the stuff I have seen, uh, research I've seen, has been on the dietary side. So like probiotics and then also some B vitamins and some things like that is trying to, at least in the rumen, trying to bolster the development and of the epithelium in the rumen. So things like... Uh, butyric acid because it is a major energy source for the epithelium of the rumen and then things like uh, niacin or thiamine have been tried and and have shown some benefit in different situations and i think this is also a great example of you have to have a clear case definition or how do i know this animal has leaky gut or not before i can say can i get rid of leaky gut or not the only way that we can tell the, or measure it or determine it is we dose a marker to the animal orally and we take blood samples or urine samples and we measure the amount of marker in there so we know well this animal had more of that marker across the GI tract than this other animal um, and it shouldn't be crossing the GI tract at all because it's a large molecule. Right now that's our only way to determine it. Yeah, and so we can clearly document it occurs, but the only way to document it is in a research setting, Mm -hmm. right? We can't do that in the field with all the other animals that are out there. So interesting disease process, and you'll keep us updated. You've got some research ongoing looking at how it's tied to other disease syndromes, but wanted to make you aware that that's kind of an emerging thought process and I think could enable us to hopefully work forward with those calves. Mm -hmm. Next thing we're going to talk about is sudden death in calves. And I think this is an important topic. And and a lot of times we think about these calves being healthy, out grazing. We're not spending a lot of time in the summer maybe watching them. A lot of times when we think calf death loss, we know from surveys and research that the greatest risk of death is right around birth due to calving difficulty. And then those first three to four weeks uh, due to scours and things like that. Uh, that are associated with that. Now, once we get past that stage, that's when it actually gets kind of frustrating because I I don't expect death loss in calves that have kind of gotten over that risk period, but occasionally you do. And a couple of the diseases are both clostridial diseases, one of which is black leg, and that can cause these calves that are out suckling their mothers to die quite suddenly, and you may not see any signs of illness until you find a dead one. Then there's another clostridial disease that's called clostridium perfringens or overeating disease. Both of those act really rapidly, both black leg and clostridium perfringens. So oftentimes as a producer, maybe the first thing you see is a dead calf, and he seemed to be fine yesterday. Brian, tell us a little bit about those clostridials. Yeah, so clostridial organisms, they can form spores, and so they kind of go into a hibernation state, for lack of a better term. They can live in the soil for years, and that's usually where you find clostridial organisms or clostridial organisms associated with these two diseases. Where does tetanus come Similar. into play? So a lot of times if you have a hurt history of this sudden death, you know, one of the things we'll ask, you know, has there been any disruption to the soil? Whether that's we dug a new pond, severe drought where cattle are grazing the grass really low, those kinds of things can kind of increase your risk for having these diseases. But as you guys have said, the, the vaccine, especially for black leg, seems to be fairly effective. And so if you've been vaccinating for it, it's 
we probably won't see a lot of cases. So I want to talk about those two diseases separately. You mentioned blackleg, and actually within the classification of clinical blackleg, there are a handful of bacteria that actually cause similar type symptoms, which often presents the first sign that they may present with is death. And mm-hmm. what would you expect to see in those calves? And what about the other calves? Are they at risk at that point? Well, the, the term blackleg really has to go it deals with the fact that if you have a, a calf that dies from this disease and you do a necropsy and you open him up, he's got areas of muscle that have just turned black. So if I happen to catch them before they die, you might see things like lameness or you know real muscle pain. They actually release a toxin and they die relatively rapidly. So oftentimes I don't see that. But they're pretty diagnostic lesions when you open them up and you can find these areas where the muscle has really been destroyed. There's a little bit of a cycle here because... So the clostridial organisms, they're all anaerobes, which means they live and thrive in environments without oxygen. And so a lot of times probably what happens is those spores are circulating in the animal's blood and they get an injury that then creates that anaerobic environment within the muscle that then allows the bacteria to proliferate. So so there's a little bit of kind of back and forth where the spores are everywhere, the bacteria are everywhere. We get maybe an initial injury insult, and then that sets them up for developing the case of blackleg. And then the toxin makes the, the clinical signs of that within the muscle even worse. And I think that's important to distinguish from the other one that you mentioned, Clostridium perfringens, which is not in the vaccine. And we feel like the blackleg vaccine is pretty darn effective. Yes. And helps with prevention, given at the right time in the right way. Talk to your veterinarian about a schedule for the black leg vaccine. But that does not help with clostridium perfringens, which you also refer to as overeating. Describe that a little bit, Bob. So this is one of the most frustrating diseases because a lot of times it's calves that are doing really well. And maybe the reason they're doing really well is their their dam is a good milker. So kind of the textbook way I was taught was a calf takes a, a good milk meal. And it's a beautiful sunny day, so he lays down and he's just stretched out enjoying life. But kind of goes through a gut stasis. The gut isn't moving very much because he's just relaxed and he had a big milk meal. And that clostridium perfringens overgrows and again it's a toxin producing organism and you have this perfectly good healthy calf maybe one of the better doing calves and he dies quite rapidly there are vaccines for this and they work okay the problem is the timing and getting the timing to work just right as far as administration of vaccine versus when the risk is is difficult and so i would say we get partial control the good thing is these tend to be sporadic it tends to not be a lot of calves but it's not zero and it's a really good doing cat. When is the right timing for that vaccine and what do we need to be trying to plan? A few weeks before I need it. And that's the problem <laughs> as I don't know exactly when I'm going to need it. Once again, that was the Beef Cattle Institute's Bob Larson, Brian Lubers, Brad White, and Philip Lancaster. I will link the full Cattle Chat podcast episodes in today's show notes on actday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but stick around because we'll be right back. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Friday show with a weather update with K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. Chip, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Chip, this past week we've been a little on the cool and dry side? Yeah, we've had cooler weather over the last 7 to 10 days. And when we look at the July as a whole for the state of Kansas so far, we've had a couple of warmer days, a couple hundred degree plus days. But overall, temperatures have been three to five degrees below normal for July. And that's something (laughs) that hopefully everyone really was able to soak in and appreciate because obviously that's going to change in the forecast. But it's been really nice and good, the fact that despite the weather being cooler, it worked out well with below normal precipitation for portions of the southern Flint Hills and north central Kansas. But this area has really, really missed most of the rain events over the last several weeks, and they have significantly dried out where they have not had moisture southern of those locations for the last 30 days. They developed three to even four inches below normal precipitation deficits in that period, and so that cooler than normal temperatures really helped offset that and helped uh, prevent some of the more significant impacts of that little precipitation. Are we going to see a change in the weather pattern from cool to dry to something else? Yeah, so the pattern has definitely changed 
uh, over the last several days. And it's most noticeable by the, the smoke in the sky, where there's been a lot of haze. And, and it's not necessarily smoke at the surface, but it's, it's up aloft. And that smoke from the, the fires out in the western U.S. and western Canada. Now that smoke has shifted and is moving south over the central plains. And the reason for that is a ridge of high pressure that was focused over the western part of the U.S. has now shifted east into the central U.S. And that has allowed the, the warmer temperatures to move eastward with it, as well as the smoke. And so this just slight, I mean, it's not a huge shift. We're not talking a drastic one eating weather pattern. We're talking a shift to about 200, 300, 400 miles of the upper level ridge and what that means is a complete 180 in our in our conditions for a lot of folks especially for southwest kansas that are really wet lately that shift in the ridge cuts off the monsoonal moisture we see in the southwest that's been seeping eastward into the southwestern kansas and then it's going to bring the heat with it and it's also going to intensify so we're going to see a, a much bigger area of heat across the central plain but it's also going to bring drier conditions and that combination in the warmest time of the year, it tends to yield some pretty rough times for agriculture uh, during a time where we really need precipitation to help uh, keep the corn and, and sorghum, and then we're entering August, the so soybeans go into. How much warmer is it going to get? So we're looking at temperatures exceeding 100 degrees that will likely start this weekend. We've been gradually warming up throughout the week, and we might go into a stretch where we can see probably about at least seven maybe eight days of 100-degree-plus heat across the state. And, and the good news is we're not going to see a lot of wind with it, but unfortunately it's going to be combined with no precipitation. And, and the western part of the state should see temperatures still going to be dry enough that they should see temperatures cool off enough at night that at least cattle can recover from this heat. The further east, you're going to have more humidity, definitely going to have higher heat indices that combine with it. So really concerned about excessive heat. The Climate Prediction Center outlined all of Kansas for excessive heat through the 7th, 8th of August. So we're talking two weeks out now. And um, fortunately, it's summer. We've gotten really lucky. We haven't had a significant heat wave like this so far, but uh, it, it's coming. And Chip, wanting to make a mention of a tool on the mesonet that can be really beneficial when it comes to making sure animals are being able to cool down at night. Yeah, we have the Animal Comfort product which allows folks to, to get in there and look at the seven-day forecast and see what the expected highs and, and lows are in animal comfort each day. And you can look out the next seven days, and that's at mesonet.ksu.edu. You can go up to the top left at those three bars, go to agriculture, and then animal comfort, and you can either look at the current conditions or the anticipated forecast conditions because we talk about this much heat, then we need to consider alternating and adjusting our the schedules for feed and, and protective coverings for cattle just so we can be proactive and minimize loss. That was K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. I will link that Mesonet tool in today's show notes on agtoday.net. That's all we have for you this week on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you on Monday.